Great. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Uh, great to have you all here today. As we talk about a lot in AFN, change is where opportunity happens. And the best way to find opportunity in change is a network that is diverse in experience, expertise, and perspective. Uh, our events are intended to bring a subject matter expert together with our membership to deepen their knowledge in areas that will be relevant to how they are leading their organization. Uh, our expert today, I'm super excited, is Jane Abitanta. She's CEO of Percival Associates. After a career holding leadership positions at some of the most prominent financial institutions out there, she founded Percival Associates to help with relationship management, marketing, and presentation skills. And she works with some of the most important financial institutions and prominent executives worldwide on how they are actually making sure that their message is received by other folks. Jane, awesome to have you. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Um, so, you know, as we think about the what CEOs are doing, the, the, the title that we had for this was that communication is 90% of your job. Um, how do you, you know, when we, we talk about how important communication is to executives, what do you tell your clients on how they ought to be thinking about communication and presentations uh, yeah, as a big thanks. part of their job? Thanks, Matt. And thanks very much for having me. This is really um, a privilege to be here. So thank you for that. Um, the, people ask me all the time, what is it the CEOs don't get about communication? And the thing that I think is the number one thing that CEOs don't, CEOs don't get is that they don't understand that their um, teams are watching everything they do. So everything is communication. What you say, how you look, how you react, what you're writing, um, you know, if you kind of get grumpy in the morning walking into the office, if you're still doing that, um, and not saying hello to people, all that really matters. People are watching all the time. And so at the risk of making my clients paranoid, it's more about making people aware that everything counts. And so when we were talking about um, how to describe what we were going to talk about today, I might have said, you know, communication is 110% of your daily job. Um, because I just think that uh, when people think about communication, they think about what I'm writing in my emails, that matters. Um, what I'm saying in my team meetings, speeches to the you know town halls, whatever you want to call them, and um, it all matters. So you're always on stage in some way, shape, or form. Always. Which can be uncomfortable. And so, you know, when, or for some people it might be uncomfortable. But definitely, you're having to think really hard about how you're communicating constantly then. Um, what, uh, in terms of not just being inside your own head, how do you help people think about what their communication style should be so that they can both seem somewhat authentic, but also not make all the mistakes that you might make yeah. being grumpy walking into the office? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think that, um, again, at the risk of making my clients paranoid, it's it's less about that, about feeling like you're on stage all the time. It's more about being aware that people are receiving your messages that you're either intentionally or unintentionally putting out there. Um, you're telegraphing messages all the time. And so the awareness around that, I just think is, is important, obviously. Um, and I think that, um, what I do is I work to help my clients figure out what their style is, to identify their style. I don't necessarily have to put a label on it, but a lot of my clients get all paranoid about, you're going to change me. You're going to turn me into, you know, a lot of my clients are investment people. You're going to turn me into a salesperson, you know, as, as if that's the worst thing in the world. And um, it's not about that. It's about figuring out what's really working for you in your communication style and doing more of that and getting rid of the stuff that doesn't really work. And you said something really interesting there, Matt. You said, you know, being in your own head, I think it's all about getting out of your own head and into okay. the heads of the people that you're talking or communicating with. How are those people able to hear you? What are they hearing? What are they seeing? What are they feeling? And thinking more about that. I mean, one of the things I say to people all the time is there are no leaders without followers. So if you're not taking care of your followers, I mean, every CEO here knows that. Um, and so if you're not taking care of your followers, 
not long for your job, in my opinion. Absolutely. Well, yeah, so I think your point is very well taken, is the audience is, you know, the, the critical part of the communication. Um, how do you help them think about how to get into their audience's head? Uh, what um, do they need to hear? One of the things I, I encourage a lot is asking the question. What's on your mind? What's the thing that you're concerned about? What I mean, a lot of listening um, to in terms of instead of assuming um, that, you know, um, and I think that I mean, I, I remember it at, at one of my clients, one of the very sort of senior guys was it was a guy was leaving, announced that he was leaving the firm. And that was a big deal. And um, my client didn't really want to say much or do much about that internally. They were communicating with their clients and all that, but he wasn't really talking to his people internally about what was happening. And I looked at him and I said, here's the deal. You can either tell them what's happening or they'll make it up. Right. What you plan. Yeah. And so that's, that's the thing. I think that um, you really need to talk to your people uh, and get, and have them talk to their people and their people. And really it's the hardest thing for a, for a CEO or any leader to get is really good data, good information about what's really happening because everybody's trying to kind of brush it up for you. So the extent to which you can really get out there and get decent data about what's really happening, I think that's the first thing. Um, and then trying to figure out how to translate that. Um, uh, and the other thing I guess I'd add there is you need to do all this really fast. So if something's going down in your firm, you need to get on it really fast <laughs> before people start making up what they think is happening and creating rumors yeah. and that kind of stuff. It will happen anyway, but the more proactive you can be, I think, the better. Again, I think every CEO in this room will know that. Um, but I think when you're embroiled, like this SBB bank thing, SBB institution thing, is a, is a really interesting situation because that was going on for some time before anybody really, from what I could tell, was talking about it internally in that organization. The street was rife with rumor, which right. ultimately, right. you know, created the problem. But anyway, I digress. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 I, I, it's, it's all great. Uh, so when we think about um, being able to react with speed, I would say, you know, sometimes the people are afraid of making mistakes, particularly like if you were mm -hmm. CEO of First Republic, Right. And you got to talk to the world about it. It's like, uh, there's probably uh, 83 people that are looking at every single communication that that person's making. Um, where would you think about speed versus making sure that you're filling that information gap? I think like, like anything that um, a CEO has to deal with, you're never a hundred percent. You can just, it, it's the best you can do and it's never a hundred percent. So I do think there is a balance. I think you're really right, Matt. There has to be a balance between getting it right and getting it out now. Um, but I do think that it can't be a hundred percent and it certainly can't be a hundred percent every time. Um, and I think that if there are mistakes, you're on that fast too. Um, and you're really clear and authentic about the mistake, what it was, how it happened, what you learned, what you're gonna do about it going forward. I think that that's part of, you used the word earlier about being authentic. Um, I think that you know, we, we're all talking about authenticity um, and I think it's really important to, to be um, um, able to self-disclose around yourself, around your team, around your business when mistakes are made. And I think the, the you know, there's textbooks being written about how to do that and why to, why to do it. But I think that um, for the most part, it's that's what builds trust. I mean, the thing I say, I say all the time, uh, your audio has to match your video. You have to do what you said you're going to do. You have to, I mean, you get people doing presentations, you know, and they, they stand up in front of, I mean, my favorite story about this is uh, I had a, a client in, uh, I think it was October of 08 when the world was coming to an end in the financial markets. And uh, he had come in from a trip and he obviously was sick as a dog. I mean, he literally was green. And I, he was about to go stand up in front of, I don't know, 450 of his investors and talk about the markets right. and his performance and all that. And I said, you can't do it. 
And he said, oh, I'm fine. You know, he's a trooper. And I said, ah, you may be fine, but your investor's going to take one look at you and think that the world is coming to an end at your firm. So we need to fix that and we need to fix it now. So I'm, I'm going down a rabbit hole here, but that's, yeah, the kind yeah. of thing, that's the kind of thing that people just don't realize. You know, I can tough it out. And of course you can, but that's not what people will see. And that's my job right. <laughs> is to help people right. see what people will see. I'm not sure I answered yeah, your question. I mean, <laughs> yep, well, uh, yeah, I love telling stories as a storyteller, so they get digressing. So you told this guy he can't go on. So what do did I do about put it? someone okay. up in his place? No. So I put him uh, in a room and um, I had him do some breath, breathing and physical um, exercises okay. to get his, uh, so hmm. the thing that happens uh, when we're either perceiving a threat or being nervous about speaking or whatever it is, being nervous about what you have to say, the content of what you're saying and how it'll be perceived. The thing that happens is that we're hardwired as human beings to get nervous. And what getting nervous means is um, there's a chemical reaction in the body that happens, largely hormonal, adrenaline, cortisol, things rise in the body. It's what causes the knees shaking and the voice shaking and the whatever it is, flushing, everything. And what works is breathing and breath okay. in the body. Air in the body serves to kind of soothe the parasympathetic nervous system and help you um, uh, be able to think about what it is you want to say. So what I did was I put that CEO in a room and had him moving his upper body in particular, take in and deep breathing for a good, I mean, this was pretty extreme, but a good 20 minutes. Okay. And when he came, and when he came out, he was all pink again. <laughs> he looked much better, went on stage, okay. did his thing, did a great job, went home, went to bed, showed up for cocktails, you know, at the end of the day. Right. And right. that's, I mean, that's the kind, sometimes it's really physical. And I think that the more people understand what's going on in the body, I mean, a lot of your CEOs are not going to be nervous about speaking necessarily, but um, they do need to be aware of their bodies their voices, the tone, all of that matters. In addition, of course, to the content. Right. And so right. that's the kind of, um, uh, it, it's sort of a holistic approach to, to helping people think about communication specifically. I mean, everything I do is really tailored to the individual. I don't do any group work at all. Well, and I, um, I think that's really important to think about is like, hey, we're all different in some way. We all got our own challenges that are out there. And I think that's something that I believe about leaders too, is you, you got to like, you can aspire to emulate some other leader in some way. You can't aspire to be them because they got all their own things that they and you don't want to. Before. I don't think you want to do that. One of the things that's great about you as a leader is you as a leader. And the great right. things that you know how to do and the, and the personality that you bring to it and all of that, that authenticity, all of that is really important. So that's what gets back to the, I don't want to change people, but I want to make right. sure that what's good gets elevated and what's not as good gets left behind. Yeah. I, I mean, I think uh, I, I would say people still get nervous around speaking and things like that. And I do think that that's, that's natural in some way. I've always thought about reframing as like, Hey, that means that I'm actually thinking this is important and that helps me not worry about what I'm doing. But I would say, you know, even like James Morrison from the doors, right. Uh, you know, he would actually not face the audience because he had stage fright and he was a performer. And so I do think that, you know, we still have all these things that, you know, can get in our head despite being, tops of our field in some way, shape, well, there, or form. You know, that's interesting. Uh, there are people who, um, you know, say, I, I don't need rehearsal. I can just wing it. And then, okay. But think about how good they could be if right. they did rehearse a little bit. And they did um, think about, I call it choreography, staging blocking or my performer client my performer uh, friends will call it blocking and staging you know where you move how you move and all really enhance what you're saying on the stage but um but i just think that uh running it through your head and saying it then again out loud is important to do and um 
people do get nervous and why not? I mean, <laughs> again, just going back to how we're wired as human beings, if, ever, if you're finding yourself with spotlight on you and a lot of people looking at you, I mean, I think that there's something in us that's hardwired to think they're going to eat us. Because <laughs> I think that's what we're doing. Yeah. And when you're the center right. of attention and everyone's smiling, they're not really smiling, they're, you know, grinding their teeth. So I think that's that kind of thing happens to us as human beings. And so the question is, how do we use that? I mean, you said it earlier, um, I think about nervousness is building energy. So when I feel the adrenaline coming up, I think, okay, I'm building energy to do what I need to do. Speaking publicly and especially takes a lot of energy for most people. Some people thrive on it, some right. people don't, but it does yeah. take a lot of energy. So when we're thinking about um, this level of self-awareness and, you know, there's the idea of practicing ahead of time and being able to figure those things out about yourself. Um, how would you say that executives should become more self-aware of their mm. strengths and opportunities? It's a great question. Well, I'm a big advocate for doing the work, the cognitive okay. psychodynamic work, um, therapy and becoming self-aware. Not every CEO has that kind of time. No, not every CEO is um, interested in that. But I do think there's a way in which we have to understand and know ourselves really well in order to understand and know others and to be open to that and be curious about the other. One of the things I deal with all the time is that um, the people who self-select to these big investment firms to run portfolios of capital are not necessarily particularly, often not necessarily particularly curious about other people. They've self-selected to those roles because they don't necessarily have to be. And it's so often ironic because they have to get curious about company management in order to make decisions about buying companies' debt or stock, but whatever. Um, and so I do think that there's a, there's that piece of it. And then I also think that one of the things we know about how adults learn is through experience, new experience particularly, getting feedback, and then coaching over time. And so many of my clients develop um, with me, they, they develop a strategy for how I'm going to, if it's public speaking, they're worried about how we're going to figure out how to play out of town first and then do the higher stakes things when we're, we feel like we're ready. It's okay. practice. practice. Um, but the building self-awareness is, is uh, a lot of work and really requires being able to um, look at yourself from the outside. And that's really hard for an individual to do without help from somebody else, anybody else. How much do you think you can tell someone like, hey, all right, here's something I see that you can work on versus them coming to you and saying, I would like to work on X? Uh, well, that happens every day, all day, where I get okay. the, the, the senior, the CEO or the board chair or somebody who says, you need to fix this about the CEO. And the CEO comes to me and this first question I'll say is, why are we here? And they'll, they'll get a lot of data out of that. Um, I think I'm here right. because. Um, and then I usually get them to talk to me and then I can usually figure out what needs to perhaps get worked on and then suggest it. Uh, one of the things I'm known for in my own work is being pretty direct. Um, I just don't think that most of any of my clients have any time for um, the soft shoe. Uh, so I, I'm pretty direct about my feedback and about what I think would be helpful and to make a more effective communicator in the people that I work with. I do all that feedback privately, of course. And um, um, I think that I, 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 it's a classic challenge where the presenting problem is not the underlying problem. So there is often some stealth consulting that has to happen. Yeah. But you, you know something about too, <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, well, you said, you said coaching over time, right? And so I yeah. think that we can all change as presenters for the good and for the bad. And I think to your point on being able to get data as the chief executive, the higher up in a firm that you rise, your data may end up getting 
be getting more and more flawed. And so the oh, idea absolutely. of, hey, I've got to constantly be looking back at myself as a communicator. Um, how do you help people understand that idea? Um, well, there are some people who just can't do that, who don't want to do that, okay. who don't want to know. My experience is those individuals are less successful over time. Um, but at, at the simplest level, Matt, I get people to, uh, I sit down with them to, to actually do the replay and say, here's, if we're working together and if we're trying to make, a, a, make an improvement here, let's do the replay and watch the videos. Um, so we do that. Uh, and, one, and one of the things that I do, I usually do it with people and it's terribly painful, but one of the things that I think helps is, I mean, I'm a performer myself, I'm a singer. And the thing I absolutely hate in life is what I call the humilitron, um, where somebody's done, <laughs> where somebody's taken their iPhone and done, you know, with bad lighting, really bad sound, and done, you know, the video of my performance and then posted it on, you know, YouTube. <laughs> It's absolutely the worst thing ever, um, but I learn. Um, right. So that's not that I'm encouraging anyone to do that. Please don't do that. But um, but it, but it's the learning that really happens. And I think that what I try to do with that case is to separate the audio from the video, help people listen first without seeing the video, right. and just use the video without listening to the audio. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. The audio and the video really helps manage how much data is coming at you at one time. Right. Um, right. So that's one thing. And I think that if there are people who just aren't interested, I don't usually work with those people because I can't help them. And I don't like to lose. Um, so I, sure. I just have to say no to that kind of work. Um, but that's what but I call it's myself. It's a great position to be in, though. And then they're I, like, well, no, I do want it. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes and sometimes I say, go away. We don't want you. Um, but uh, but that's why I call myself a leadership and communications coach. Because very often the communications issues, if there are any, are coming from an underlying leadership issue and vice versa. Sure. The leadership issue can be coming from a communication issue. And I just feel that those two things seem to dovetail with many of the people I work with. Right. Um, well, one of the mechanisms that we're having to communicate with more and more and more, you know, for a long time, we thought about presentation skills, you're in the room with people, you can, you know, find eye contact with people, things like that. With us doing so much communication over Zoom, Teams, things like that, what are some of the things that you feel like are missed in translation by leaders that they, they need to understand about virtual communication as opposed to in person? The very first thing is eye contact. You have to look at the dot, not the screen. And okay. you, don't have to, you don't have to do it all the time. I'm being obnoxious and doing it now exclusively, but yeah. you have to do it a lot. And particularly when you have a key point you're trying to make, you have to yeah. look at the camera. So that's the first thing. Um, the other thing, I, I mean, I, I actually think a lot of the Zoom, uh, and I'm using Zoom, but any of the, um, video conferencing stuff is is more about preparation and the use of lighting and and position and not a lot of the physical stuff so one of the things you'll notice is that my camera is placed a little bit above my um, um sight line and that's because that's a better position generally for people to be perceived in um, my lighting is all natural. It's coming from, um, day, it's daylight now, so I can do it this way. It's coming from windows. That's the better thing to do. And I'll put a window behind you. And all that stuff is well documented and people can look that up. But mm -hmm. I think that um, what I think happens is, is people get really kind of freaked out about the idea of talking into a camera. It's the same thing ha that happens when people are having to do presentations on television, things like that. that um, they're not actually talking to a person. So I have people all over the world with children's toys placed behind the camera and they talk to the toy. That's um, awesome. When I'm helping people, yeah. you could actually clip it on the top of my, I have it clipped on the top of my laptop to remind me. Post-it notes with an arrow, look at the camera. Um, and when, yeah. I'm, when people are working with television and media, um, I get a producer or I will sit below the, the teleprompter 
So they're talking to me. And it just feels more natural. It's the same thing we used to deal with with teleconferencing. Maybe we still are. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Where people were talking to the the phone and feeling weird about it. Right. So right. I always say, talk to a person. If you have to imagine the person, if you have to mimic the person with the child's toy, if you have to put the producer under the, or you're somebody you care about underneath the camera, whatever you have to do, talk to a person. Great, great. No, that's awesome advice. Um, one of the things that I think is really interesting is how you manage audience interactions, whether in a virtual format mm -hmm. or in an in-person format. Mm -hmm. and questions you take versus, you know, saying wait until the end or not taking questions at all. How do you help um, your clients think about communicating with the audience, getting them actually communicating with you directly? Well, the first thing I remind them about is the audio matching the video. We're a transparent organization. We, our doors are always open, but we're not going to take any questions. That doesn't really work live or on Zoom. So I think you need to figure out how you're going to take questions and manage that okay. so that it's effective. Um, I think that, um, I, you know, it's interesting. I think that there's a way, there are all kinds of ways to engage an audience. I mean, I normally start, if I'm doing a Zoom thing with a group, I usually ask questions to start. Why are you here? Why are we here? What's the first, put it in the chat if we need to, if it's a big group. What are the, what's the number one thing you're concerned about today? Why'd you make yep. time for this meeting today? What's the best use of your time today? What, I've got a bazillion of those questions. And so that gets people engaged. I think if I'm working with a group, um, I always have people turn their video on because I think that keeps people engaged. Um, we've had some funny moments. That's not as much recently, but we've had some funny moments with the video on, but, um, but that's, I mean, it's, it's almost the same as you would do in person in terms of engaging an audience. You're just not physically there. Yeah. Does that yeah. Sense? Um, Absolutely. I think one of the problems that we've got with things like Zoom or, you know, teleconference calls a little bit less is like just that slight bit of latency, right, where people can talk over each other a little bit. And yeah. that feels awkward. Because it is awkward. And I think if we just acknowledge it, that helps okay. people. And then there's ways of, you know, you can use the put your hand up thing, the reaction. Yep. It's on Zoom in the in the nav bar. You can um, apologize for jumping over somebody. Uh, you can, uh, I, I just think that it, it, we have to acknowledge it. And the latency, I'm so glad you brought that up because that's a real thing that people are wondering why I've been in Zoom calls all day and I'm exhausted. It's because your brain is working overtime because of that nanosecond latency. It's trying to make sense of that the entire time. And it's exhausting. Okay. Not to mention yeah. eye strain on the screen and all that, which everybody goes through. But, but I think that that's something that if you just understand it, makes it a lot easier to okay. deal with. Okay. So I've been really encouraging, and again, we're meeting more in person now, but um, encouraging my clients to limit how many Zooms they do and to think about, is a Zoom required here? Like, what's the issue? And then given the issue, how close do we need to be in person to deal with it? Yeah, and yeah. if a phone call will deal with it, do the phone call. <laughs> right, right. So you have to match the tech to task or match the task to the tech. And so that's something else I get trying to get people to think of because we're all defaulting now. Well, I'll set up a Zoom. We don't need a Zoom. I can talk on the phone to you and it'll be fine. Yeah. Um, all right. I got, I got one more question that I want to ask and yeah. then we'll open it up to other folks. Uh, all of our CEOs, we have some nonprofits that we work with as well in AFN. All of our CEOs have to ask for money at some point, though, whether they're raising mm -hmm. capital, whether they're trying to get a deal or whether they're trying to get a donation for their organization. Um, asking for money is uncomfortable for some people. Some people get over it. But when you're thinking about that as kind of the underlying, like, hey, how do we get a deal done or how, how can I make that ask? Um, what's some of the advice that you would give to folks who are thinking about themselves in that particular situation? You know, it's the moments come where I got to make the ask, how do they make sure that they're presenting in the right way? Um, there's a big question. 
uh, yeah. because I think there's the negotiating piece, there's getting to the table piece, there's the once at the table, the, after the negotiation, how do you close the deal? So it's, it's a big question. But I think that if I had a piece of advice on this is um, to acknowledge to yourself that asking for money is uncomfortable and to think about what's in it for the other. So uh, an investment in my company gets you this. An investment in my fund can solve this problem for you in your portfolio allocation. A donation to, um, I'll pitch the Council for Economic Education, because I'm on the board of that and we're raising money, um, is a way to really enhance access to financial literacy for kids nationwide. You know, do you want to be part of that? This is a way to be part of that. I mean, I think you just have to get out of it, it's getting out of your head again about, you know, if I don't get this money by the end of the quarter, I'm, yeah. it's more about what's in it for the other. Okay. So reframing it towards like, what's the value that you're providing Absolutely. to the counterparty? Okay, great. All right, um, Jane, thanks a lot for this first part of the conversation. Really sure. appreciate it. Uh, enjoyed talking.